Hello and welcome to CEC Online Lectures. Uh, today I will discuss with you uh, another set of fallacies which uh, broadly comes under the label of uh, fallacies of uh, presumption. In the fallacies of presumption, uh, too much is assumed in the premises. The inference to the conclusion depends mistakenly on these unwarranted assumptions which means uh, what is assumed is faulty, unwarranted or unprovable and definitely a conclusion arising out of such propositions or a set of propositions in which one of them is a dubious assumption will be entirely misleading and the argument will uh, of course be uh, fallacious. Now uh, here the assumed premise may seem relevant to the conclusion and uh, we may even fail to notice it. So as uh, good logic students, we should pay attention to the claims or premises whose truth is uncertain. Please remember that uh, fallacies are not obviously bad arguments or reasoning, but what appear to be good reasoning. And only upon close examination uh, are they uncovered as bad reasoning. And it is not just that uh, you will find ordinary people committing such fallacies, but uh, you will find philosophers committing such fallacies as well. Uh, here is a quotation from an honest philosopher, Bertrand Russell reading uh, George Cantor and copying out uh, the gist of him into a notebook. At that time, I falsely supposed all his arguments to be fallacious, but I nevertheless went through them all in the minutest detail. They stood me in good stead when later on I discovered that all the fallacies were mine. So let us start with the first fallacy which comes in this category and it is fallacy of accident. It is an informal fallacy in which a generalization is applied to individual cases that it does not govern. In other words, in this fallacy, some generalization is applied to an instance but it turns out that this is an inappropriate application. It is also called the fallacy of destroying the exception. If you remember, uh, in my lecture on uh, the fallacies of defective induction, I discussed the fallacy of hasty generalization, which is also called the fallacy of converse accident. In that fallacy, we noticed that uh, a generalized conclusion was being drawn hastily and carelessly from insufficient premises. Here, we witness the opposite, which is why there is some similarity in labeling the two as converse accident and accident. And I just, as I just um, mentioned uh, in the definition of the fallacy of accident, that um, uh, from a general claim, we arrive at a specific conclusion which does not justifiably follow from it. So, uh, let us now understand the fallacy of accident schematically, and then I will discuss a few examples. So, the schematic representation of the fallacy of accident is X is a general rule, therefore, there are no exceptions to X. Now, um, if you have read Plato, you would know that uh, in his Republic, while discussing the notion of justice, um, he considers various meanings uh, which could aptly define justice. So uh, Socrates, who's the mouthpiece of Plato, uh, argues with Cephalus, Polymarchus, and Thrasymachus to reach a definite answer on um, what is justice. 
Now, Cephalus claims justice is um, telling the truth and paying one's debts. Polymachus uh, defines justice as doing good to good men and bad to bad men. And Thrasymachus defines justice as what is in the interest of the stronger. I will take up the definition of Cephalus now. Plato argues uh, if justice is telling the truth and paying one's debts, then this rule must apply in a situation where uh, a weapon is borrowed um, a, a weapon borrowed from uh, from a friend who has uh, become mentally ill is demanded back by him and uh, if this man does not return the weapon he would be doing an unjust action so we have a clear case here where the exception demonstrates that the rule cannot be applied to all cases and which is the exact point of the fallacy. Now let us take up the definition by Polymachus. He argues justice is doing good to good people and bad to bad people. Let us see what happens if this general rule is applied to a situation which Plato of course has pointed out. And the situation is where a man fails to recognize who is a good man and uh, who is a bad man. Also, following the general rule of doing harm to uh, the bad man will make the just man even worse. Again, the rule does not apply to all cases. Now, Thrasymachus' argument for the conclusion that uh, justice lies in the interest of the stronger comes from the assumption that um, anything that is applauded and accepted in a society uh, is that which is encouraged by the people in power. Similarly, anything that is unaccepted in a society is that which is deplored by them. Now, if this were to be regarded as a general rule, then imagine what plight the society would be in. So Plato rightly demol uh, demolishes this uh, definition by giving a counterexample. Uh, the construction of the counter-arguments uh, counter uh, enables us to know uh, why something cannot be used as, uh, as a general, uh, general rule. Plato argued uh, that humans are, they do not always know what is in their best interest. And so it is likely that uh, the powerful people mistakenly make laws which um, instead of benefiting them damage their interest so again the rule does not apply to every particular case now why am i discussing this see when someone defines some concept then that definition acquires universal application as it becomes a general rule and with Plato's arguments, I'm sure you have understood how exceptions could demolish all these definitions. So point to be noted, we should never ignore exceptions. I will now take some uh, non-philosophical examples. Uh, the first one is, because human beings have teeth shaped to eat meat, therefore, Human beings are meat eaters. It is true that human beings have sharp front teeth, uh, which are called uh, canines, just as tigers and lions do. But is that a reason to call all human beings meat eaters? It is not. It is a fallacious argument because the general claim is not applicable to humans who do not eat meat. So, it is an inappropriate application. Now, let us come to the second example. In India, driving vehicles on the right-hand side of the road is a punishable offense. Therefore, driving on the right side of the road while, while taking an accident victim to the hospital is a punishable offense. But consider the situation. There is a bleeding accident victim on the road. 
the hospital is not far away so instead of calling an ambulance a car driver um, picks up uh, the accident victim puts him in the car and drives to the hospital the left side is jammed because of rush hour so the driver drives on the right side to reach the hospital fast but he is stopped by the policeman are we not again committing the fallacy of accident how can it be wrong to take an accident victim to the hospital and save his life it is a case of exception to the rule so to sum up the discussion on the fallacy of accident i would like to say that um, what is true of a general rule say p in circumstances x may not be true in circumstances y as i keep telling you in all my lectures always keep your logical antennas up now the second fallacy under the fallacies of presumption is called complex question consider this example an englishman on reaching yellow knife which is one of the coldest places in canada remarks to his tourist guide isn't it cold now this question of course demands a yes from the tourist guide but because he is a native of yellow knife he does not feel as cold as the englishman does but look at the framing of the sentence isn't it cold now what choice does the guide have he does not want to say no because it is cold indeed but he also does not want to say yes because in yellow knife it gets much colder than that so if the question is to be answered in just one word then we know already the question is loaded what loaded means will be clear when we discuss the definition of the fallacy of a complex question and the actual cases of this fallacy let us first understand what the fallacy of complex question is it is uh, an informal fallacy in which a question is asked in such a way as to presuppose the truth of some proposition buried in the question it appears that the answer that is sought presupposes a prior answer to the same question for example if your teacher asks you have you stopped cheating in the exams see how the question is articulated how we answer this if you notice the answer appears to be already sneaking out of the question and it is either a categorical yes or a categorical no uh, if you say yes that will amount to your accepting that you used to previously cheat in the exams and that now you have stopped cheating and if you say no that will mean you still cheat in the exams so basically the other party which is uh, uh, expected to answer has no choice and as copy says that um, the fallacy of complex question is often a deceitful device the speaker may pose some question then answer it or strongly suggest the answer with the truth of the premise that had been buried in the question simply assumed they are trick questions schematically put question x presupposes answer y as accepted even before y is uttered we generally witness uh, cases of the fallacy of complex question in the courts where the lawyers make use of it to implicate someone or uh, make someone appear guilty of a crime you must have seen in the movies where uh, in a court room a prosecutor frames his question uh, in in such a manner that uh, it must be answered in a single word uh, which is either a yes or a no so let us take an example of a court room seen where um, Uh, a prosecutor questions the accused who is standing in the witness box the prosecutor asks were you not wearing a blue cap when you murdered mr rex now the accused if he is not that smart may respond spontaneously either with a yes in which case he is in trouble as he has uh, um, uh, admitted his crime 
or he may respond by saying no meaning he wasn't wearing a blue cap on that day again in answering this question he has gotten into the trap set by uh, the prosecutor as he has in a way accepted the crime of murdering mr x the prosecutor may even modify his question and ask the accused did you not murder mr x um in the evening of the 16th of july the accused may respond by saying no meaning either it was not the evening of the 16th of july or it wasn't the 16th of july but in any case he falls into the trap imagine if he is innocent and does not know anything about the crime the framing of these questions will have really put him into a lot of trouble coming back to the question uh, by the prosecutor and the question is were you wearing a blue cap on the day you murdered mr x what can the accused uh, say if the question only demands a yes or a no surely he would want to scream in the lo uh, loudest pitch possible that he has not murdered mr x and if he is aware of logic he would tell the court that this prosecutor is committing the fallacy of complex question but a smart defendant even if he is guilty might respond what murder now um i wish to discuss a complex case uh, of the fallacy of complex question nepal in the year 2015 Uh, became a country with an effective parliamentary democracy but it wasn't like this before earlier it was following the panchayat system which uh, constitutionalized absolute power to the monarchy which of course was not um, elected representation of the people of nepal so the king was the head of the state and the sole authority over all the institutions of the government now with this background we can now discuss our example on may 1980 the citizens of nepal with 66.7% voters taking part voted 54.7% for and 45.3% against the panchayat system that would maintain monarchy on the referendum the people were asked the question do you want the panchayat system to continue yes or no the people were probably smart enough to figure out that the choice was really between the monarchy and parliamentary democracy since the panchayat system could only continue under the monarchy If someone answered the referendum with a yes this did not imply that he approved of monarchy rather they were apprehensive that parliamentary democracy would make them even more powerless as the panchayat system in which they have some input would be taken away also they were apprehensive about who would take over power in the parliamentary system even the military could eventually come to power and this would not be desirable if the referendum had been worded as follows do you approve of the present constitutional monarchy or do you prefer a democracy where the government is completely representative that is it consists only of elected representatives then the result might have been quite different in any case the electorate on the whole recognized that as the referendum was posed it was the fallacy of complex question now let us move on to the last fallacy in this category of the fallacy of presumption and it is petitio principii this fallacy is also called by the name begging the question which is the english translation of the latin name petitio principii it is an informal fallacy in which the conclusion of an argument is stated or assumed in one of the premises 
meaning the premise of the argument assumes the truth of what it is supposed to prove by it consider the argument non violence is advantageous to everyone therefore non violence is to be valued so here the speaker to the uh, to influence the hearer plays a trick by effectively reformulating the premise as the conclusion and therefore such an argument has no merit and whoever makes an argument of this sort commits the fallacy sometimes however the speaker himself and the hearer too may overlook um, the disguised presence of the premise in the conclusion and ultimately fail to recognize the fallacy embedded in the argument let us uh, take the most famous examples first argument 1 This is the ontological argument proposed by many in the history of philosophy to prove the existence of God and it goes like this Premise 1 God contains all perfections Premise 2 Existence is a perfection therefore conclusion God exists On the face of it it looks like a valid argument However, philosophers have criticized this argument on the charge of it committing the fallacy of petitio principii. Let us understand why it is fallacious. Look at the conclusion: God exists. And now have a look at uh, the first premise, which is God contains all perfections. Now, do you realize that the premise already assumes the conclusion? If the first premise is true then the conclusion by all means will be true also for it is impossible for a non-existent god to contain all perfections and therefore the argument is said to beg the question however there is an abundance of literature from uh, medieval logicians to uh, one of the contemporary logicians like um, Alvin Plantinga Uh, and perhaps one of the most profound logicians of all times kurt godel who who uh, defend the ontological argument against uh, the objection of um, begging the question or circularity if interested you can read up on these on 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 the internet but this argument enables us to question uh, the nature of all deductive arguments because if you look at the form of any deductive argument you will know that uh, there is one universal premise in it so let us consider the famous deductive argument all men are mortal socrates is a man therefore socrates is mortal now i'm sure you can ascertain what the problem is obviously when something is stated in the premise as an established truth which obviously is universal in nature and in this case it is all men are mortal um then how can we expect a particular conclusion and in this case it is a singular proposition socrates is mortal to be defined universality the conclusion is already buried in the universal premise so the arguments which come at the fallacy of petitio principii are called circular arguments and we must remember one thing that uh, and that is uh, the premises are not irrelevant to the conclusion and irving mama copy rightly says that these fallacious arguments are not made just by silly people alone but many great minds have been seen trapped in this kind of reasoning rene descartes uh, his his most famous statement i think therefore i am has been criticized by many as a case of petitio principii is it really so let us do some research now this statement can be stated as an argument as uh, i think therefore i am in the first premise descartes says i think now when he uses the word i to refer to himself he is already assuming that he exists so the conclusion in which 
uh, he says I am is already contained in the premise. So the argument begs the question. However, the defenders of Descartes say that the statement I think therefore I am is not presented in the form of an argument by Descartes. Rather, he was making a statement based on intuition that it is impossible to think without existing. Anyway, uh, coming back to fallacy. Um, if an argument begs the question, it quite clearly fails. Generally, the point of an argument is that it should give reasons to accept its conclusion. But if that conclusion is assumed by the reason offered, those reasons provide no independent support for the conclusion. The argument should persuade only those who already share the assumptions. In other words, those who already agree with the conclusion. Now let us discuss the inductive principle, which states that instances of which we have had no experience must resemble those of which we have had experience and that the course of nature continues always uniformly the same. So basically what the principle means is that the natural laws will work tomorrow because they are effectively working today and they have effectively worked in the past. The sun will rise tomorrow because it has always risen in the past. Now David Hume, a very influential uh, philosopher, has questioned this kind of inductive reasoning because it begs the question, it is circular. Let us schematically understand why this is um, uh, circular or this inductive reasoning is circular. Future has always resembled the past, therefore future will resemble the past. Now, you understand the circularity here? So David Hume argues that we do not have any demonstrative proof to know that the future will resemble the past or that there is uniformity in nature because we can easily imagine this world uh, to be changing in many ways and respects in, 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 in the future. Our present experiences do not count as evidence to conclude that, uh, 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 what the future will be like. The sun has risen in the past does not guarantee that it will rise tomorrow. Now uh, I will end my lecture with uh, Kopi's remark on circular arguments. Kopi says, circular arguments are certainly fallacious, but the premises are not irrelevant to the conclusions drawn. They are relevant. Indeed, they prove the conclusion, but they do so trivially. They end where they began. A petitio principii is always technically valid, but always worthless. With this, I will end today's lecture. Thank you so much. Stay safe.